Hi everyone! Today we're here to talk to you about math for a special arcane math episode. This is a fitting channel for it since I'm somewhat known for using math and game design and Linda has degrees in math and math education. Specifically, let's talk about how to use math as a tool to analyze options in your favorite tabletop RPG. We'll be diving into specific examples involving Pathfinder 2nd Edition and revealing some secrets that are especially helpful in that game, but the basic principles apply in any game. By the end of this episode, you'll understand the strengths and weaknesses of the most common mathematical analysis tools, and you'll have a deeper understanding of the true origins of the joke feat Omega Strike. Let's start with expected damage per round, or DPR. This is the main metric used in most online discussions of tabletop RPGs. If you're more familiar with real-time video games, you might have heard of the similar sounding damage per second, or DPS. The concept is basically the same here, but measured across a round, which is more relevant in a tabletop RPG than a second. One of the biggest benefits of DPR is that it's easy to calculate. All you have to do is take your chance of each type of result, multiply that by that result's average damage, and add the results up. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, results are typically critical success, success, failure, or critical failure, but other games have different possibilities. For instance, an attack with a 50% chance of a normal hit for 10 damage, a 20% chance of a critical hit for 20 damage, and a 30% chance of missing for no damage would have a DPR of 5 from the normal hit, plus 4 from the critical hit, plus 0 from the miss, or 9. In much the same way, a spell where the enemy has a 15% chance to critically succeed on their save for no damage, a 50% chance to succeed on their save for 10 damage, a 30% chance to fail on their save for 20 damage, and a 5% chance to critically fail their save for 40 damage would have a DPR of 13. By using DPR, we could see that the higher base damage and the damage on a successful save caused the spell to deal around 50% more damage per round, even though the attack was much more accurate. This is a very important benefit of using DPR over simply eyeballing the damage alone or the accuracy alone. It might sound obvious that it's better to combine the two like this, but it's not as obvious as you think. In fact, the Pathfinder 1st Edition bestiary Monster Credition creation system doesn't acknowledge the way that accuracy and damage combine at all, and instead focuses purely on total damage if all attacks hit, causing a giant with a sword and four attacks with accuracy of plus 20, plus 15, plus 10, and plus 5 to be assigned the same damage per hit as a beast that attacks with four claws all at plus 20 to hit, starting in the second bestiary where they use this monster creation system more strictly. This failure to account for accuracy was one of the reasons why creatures using natural attacks were known to be more dangerous in Pathfinder 1st Edition than creatures with weapons were. Using DPR, or at least some approximation for it, would have helped Pathfinder 1st Edition avoid this mistake. As we can see, it's much better to use DPR than a more simplistic calculation like maximum possible damage or average damage if all attacks hit. But it does have one drawback, which lies in the allure of its ease of use. DPR is so easy to calculate and even to automate in a spreadsheet with easy to visualize graphs that it presents a temptation to use DPR and then stop your analysis right there. Typically, the mathematical analysts and number crunchers who have made the decision to just stick with DPR understand that there's more to the story. And they just want to stop there because it's a lot more work, and that work would need to be justified. But from that point on, the DPR-only analysis can take on a life of its own, where it passes through a gaming group or even a wider community, in a way that treats it as the whole story, even though the original analyst knew it wasn't. This whole dynamic led me to create the Omega Strike feat as a joke. At this point, I've seen the origins of the joke feat distorting in various places, including some claims that Paizo wrote it into an April Fool's product, or it was a scrapped feat from a project. And I've also seen some arguments that tried to use the feat's existence to support a variety of different conclusions. So, to set the record straight, about four years ago, while I was working at Paizo, I had an idea for a joke class for April Fool's Day that I was writing on my own in my free time. 
The basic idea was that the class would have an extremely weak core chassis, but actually be balanced to play with class features that have flavor text that suggests the class's designer wanted to design a nearly useless class, but that the play testers convinced the designer to add additional features, making the class playable. The subclasses were based on different kinds of playtesters, such as White Room Theory Crafter versus Power Gamer or Marathon Playtester. In the end, I didn't finish that class, but one thing I did start writing was a set of feats with the trap trait that were meant to be bad in a way that applies to each of the subclasses. For the Theory Crafter subclass, I included the Omega Strike feat. For one action, you attempt to strike. If the attack succeeds, before rolling damage, roll 1d100. On any result but 100, the attack does nothing. On a 100, the attack deals a thousand times the normal damage. Since the Omega Strike feat that Mark proposed has a 99% chance to deal no damage on a hit, and a 1% chance to deal 1,000 times damage, the Omega Strike feat has an astounding 10 times higher DBR than a normal strike. Something that nothing else in Pathfinder 2nd Edition can claim. But it's also a terrible option. If your group fights about three combat encounters per session, of about three to four rounds each, and you spend each of these encounters swinging with Omega Strike as often as possible, you'll probably hit somewhere around ten times per session, though it depends on what you're fighting. That means that with one session per week, you'll probably contribute nothing for multiple months of play, only to instantly evaporate a single target and then go back to doing nothing. Omega Strike illustrates two of the three principles we'd like to talk about here today when it comes to going beyond DPR. Those are overkill damage, the related spike damage, and reliability. We'll also have a follow-up video about mitigation. Today's three principles are ways in which DPR doesn't tell you the whole story, even when you're looking only at damage. And the last is a way that other choices besides damage and accuracy and damage boosts contribute to your overall success and even boost your damage over a fight. The big problem with Omega Strike is that it fell badly afoul of both overkill damage and reliability. The idea with overkill damage is that any damage you dealt beyond the amount necessary to defeat the opponent is overkill. It's wasted, it didn't provide you any value compared to if it hadn't existed. At the most extreme example that comes up in play, when the enemy is at one hit point because of ferocity, your single action force barrage that always hits for 1d4 damage is a better option than swinging your sword for 25 damage, even if you're very likely to hit. If you can avoid it, you don't want overkill damage. And if you're plotting out the damage you dealt during a playtest or a white room scenario, it's useful to try looking at it against a target with a specific number of hit points remaining and then to see what your damage would be both with and without counting the overkill damage. Most often DPR analyses won't do this in an attempt to be as generic as possible and it won't matter for attacks that aren't close enough to possibly bring the enemy down which means it's most important either in early levels where a critical hit could one shot a target or in situations where the stakes are highest and an ally or foe is low on hit points. Simply by taking into account overkill damage in our DPR, we can already discredit Omega Strike. For instance, let's take a look at Omega Strike's theoretical best possible scenario. This isn't because this is an example that would actually show up in a game, but purely because looking at this extreme allows us to easily spot our principles in action. The same principles will apply in less extreme examples, but be harder to notice. Let's say you've decided to pick a fight with the Demon Lord Tree Razor. This is not a good idea. A level 10 dexterity based fighter is using a plus one striking dagger sanctified by a holy deity in order to get around Tree Razor's regeneration instead of their usual knife that has better property runes. With the party's buffs, the fighter can get at least a 45 on a natural 20 to hit, turning it from a failure into a success. A normal hit would deal 2d4 plus 6, and the resistance to physical damage cancels out Tree Razor's weakness to holy, so 11 damage. Omega Strike would deal 11,000 damage instead, but only 550 of that damage actually matters as Tree Razor has 550 hit points. As a result, 
while Omega Strike's DPR is 10 times higher without taking overkill into account, it's actually two times lower than a normal strike after factoring in overkill. This is because even in this extreme example, you only needed 50 times the normal damage to kill Tree Razor. Even if the fighter had only 10 strength and used a dagger without a striking rune, dealing 1d4 plus 3 damage per hit, Omega Strike barely managed to become equal in, in terms of DPR accounting for overkill, since you would need exactly 100 hits to kill a Tree Razor, and Omega Strike gives you a 1 in 100 chance to deal that all at once. As to which of these you might prefer, the next two principles will let you know. Let's talk about spike damage. While overkill damage is bad, spike damage, also sometimes known as burst damage, refers to the beneficial components of a less reliable attack that sometimes deals a sudden spike or burst of damage. In both tabletop RPGs and in real-time games with hit point bars, the biggest benefit of spike damage is to surprise an opponent who has a lot of options to recover, retreat, regroup, or otherwise alter their strategy based on anticipating the results of steady incoming damage. In the extreme example with Tree Razor versus the fighter using Omega Strike above, you could think of it as the fact that the normal striking fighter is obviously chipping away its Tree Razor slowly and could, regeneration aside, eventually win if Tree Razor sat there laughing at the fighter for three to four hours. But at any point during that process, Tree Razor can just kill the fighter or leave. With Omega Strike, the fighter will be appearing to be completely worthless until suddenly Tree Razor is dead. And there's actually a chance that happens on the very first attack, albeit a 1 in 2,000 chance to both hit Tree Razor and succeed on the D100 check for Omega Strike. Without the ability to cancel Tree Razor's regeneration on off turns, things look even better for Omega Strike, since it can get the job done in one hit, while the fighter using a normal strike keeps seeing the damage regenerate away on any turns the fighter misses. Essentially, spike damage is beneficial against an enemy that outclasses you in terms of strength or in terms of options for healing, mitigation, and mobility. Of these, usually the PCs in a Pathfinder 2nd Edition game are expected to win, and usually have more overall options for healing and mitigation than the average opponent, but mobility is something many creatures might have. What this means is that unless you're worried that, about the enemy running away, or are facing an unusual situation where the PCs are significant underdogs in the fight, or facing a foe with better healing and recovery options, Spike damage is not usually as useful for PCs in Pathfinder 2nd Edition as it is in games that include these elements more often, like online competitive arena games. Our next principle is reliability. It is the exact opposite of spike damage. That's not an accident. If damage is more reliable, that means both you and your foes can count on it, as opposed to spike damage that comes out of the blue and surprises everyone. In general, if you're expected to win on average by running down the clock, as is usually the case in a TTRPG like Pathfinder 2nd Edition, reliability is going to be more useful to you than spike damage. Smaller, reliable attacks at the same DPR also combine more easily with what your allies are doing and avoid dealing needless overkill damage. In the Tree Razor example, any amount of damage from allies will help the fighter who is attacking slowly 100 times and will do nothing for the fighter who is spinning the roulette on a Mega Strike until they hit a 100. As you can see, the three principles of overkill, spike damage, and reliability have a major influence on the battlefield, especially in an extreme example like Omega Strike against Tree Razor. However, they also make big changes in more realistic situations. Join us next time for an arcane math video putting those principles into play as we analyze Vicious Swing, formerly known as Power Attack.